After the uh, toughest global economic conditions in living memory, our country and the economy in the UK is starting to turn a corner, and the signs of recovery are encouraging. Growth has doubled in the last quarter. Across the UK, more people are in work than ever before. And at a time when unemployment is rising across the European Union, private sector employment here in Scotland has grown by 146,000 in the last three years. Our focus on fiscal discipline is also helping to keep interest rates low for UK businesses and families. We've reduced the deficit by a third as a percentage of GDP over the last three years and we're borrowing £49 billion less this year than the previous government. Of course, none of this is easy. There are still major economic challenges to be overcome. Many families are feeling the squeeze. Some businesses still struggle to get the credit they need. And as a country, we're working hard to repair and rebuild our battered economy. That means doing what we can to unwind the toxic legacy of the last government's economic model. Broken from the start, it didn't do enough to support balanced growth across the United Kingdom. It was lopsided, over-reliant on one specific part of the financial services industry to drive an unsustainable boom that left us vulnerable when the crisis hit. None of that can be fixed overnight. But bit by bit, we are clearing up the mess we inherited. Our critics said it couldn't be done, that the two parties of the coalition wouldn't be able to set politics aside and put our economy and our nation first. But we are proving them wrong. And so, more importantly, are you. Because ultimately, it is your enterprise and your hard work as UK and Scottish, UK and Scottish businesses that is making the difference. And tonight I want to focus on our work together, government and business, and the essential role that Scotland, as one of the UK's biggest economic success stories, plays in realising our vision for a stronger economy and a fairer society across the United Kingdom. Because I believe that the best route we have to achieving a sustainable recovery lies in strengthening that partnership between us. For me, it's a partnership that strikes that old-fashioned liberal balance between a government that gets out of the way of businesses to enable and empower you to do what you do best, create jobs and drive growth, and a government that steps in when needed to set the rules of the game essential to ensure a sustainable and competitive economy, backed up with access to finance, modern infrastructure, and a skilled workforce. That's why we're making the UK's business environment one of the most competitive in the world. Cutting corporation tax to one of the lowest rates in the G20, reducing the national insurance bill for companies, protecting the flexibility of our jobs market, and getting rid of unnecessary red tape. And that combination of measures has helped make the United Kingdom the most attractive location for overseas investment in Europe, with over 10% of the UK's 2012 foreign direct investment projects coming to Scotland. And at every step of the way in the coalition, we're fighting hard to create jobs, boost growth, make a genuine difference to people's lives across the nation. And that's why we've committed to raise the personal allowance on income tax so that basic rate taxpayers will get to keep all of the first £10,000 they earn. We've already taken over 2 million people out of paying income tax altogether. And by the, by the time these changes are complete next April, they will be worth around £700 a year for over 20 million basic rate taxpayers. We've also extended our funding for lending scheme to provide more help to small and medium-sized enterprises. And the latest figures show that under this scheme, lending to businesses and home buyers has increased. And ahead of the official launch of our new £1 billion UK business bank, we're already accepting proposals for the project's first investment round. We're also protecting and boosting investments essential to our long-term growth, setting out for the first time a long-term infrastructure strategy for the 21st century Britain, with a major boost to capital spend here in Scotland.
That's supporting a £100 million rollout of superfast broadband to communities across Scotland, a £50 million contribution to safeguard and improve the cross-border sleeper service for Scotland, and an investment in faster, more modern electric trains on the East Coast mainline. And that's in addition to our committed investment in a national high-speed rail network. Now, HS2 is central to our 21st century ambition to build a stronger economy in the UK. We know that our competitors elsewhere in the world have been investing in better roads, better railways for decades. But the last time we built a new main rail line north of London was more than 100 years ago. Rail travel has doubled in the last 20 years with important routes like the West Coast Main Line hit by serious capacity issues. HS2 will help us catch up and compete. More than doubling the number of seats between London and Birmingham, helping to slash journey times to Scotland. This is an economic growth opportunity. Completing HS2 will help us to tackle the north-south divide that scarred our country for too long, giving eight of our biggest cities across the North and Midlands the modern rail links they deserve, as well as generating over £60 billion of benefits for the United Kingdom. The Core Cities Group estimates this investment will create around 400,000 new jobs, 70% of, of which will be based outside London. And in Scotland, we calculate it will boost the economy by around £3 billion. So here I just want to respond to those who've criticised this project in recent weeks. That includes the ex-ministers who green-lighted the idea in the first place. It's a pattern we see happening time and time again in our country. When a deal's been signed, the temptation to undermine it from the comfort of opposition can be too much for some politicians to resist. This clouds the debate, it chips away at the consensus. But the alternatives they suggest, such as upgrading existing lines, aren't viable alternatives. For example, the extra capacity created through the £9 billion upgrade of the West Coast Main Line has already been filled. We've tested our business case rigorously, and we're clear on what needs to be done to deliver this project on time and to, and to budget. That is how Britain builds the infrastructure it needs. And that's how we compete as a 21st century economy with a modern transport system that works to make us stronger. In energy, our £3.8 billion UK Green Investment Bank, headquartered here in Scotland, is helping to boost private sector investment in green energy projects. And I'm pleased to say that we can raise a glass to the bank's first project here in Scotland, with over half a, bi a million pounds committed to a new biomass boiler at Tomerton Distillery near Inverness. But that's just the start. And with our strength and support for renewables through the single British energy market, we are helping to create thousands of new jobs in Scotland. Here in Glasgow, at Strathclyde University, we're funding two new catapult centres to drive research, innovation and business development in our offshore renewables and high-value manufacturing sectors. These are investments that will help rebuild the UK's economy because the UK succeeds when Scotland succeeds and a stronger UK economy ensures a stronger Scotland. And it's precisely because of that shared prosperity that I don't want to see a barrier thrown up between Scotland and the rest of the UK. Right now, membership of the UK single market gives UK businesses unrestricted access to over 60 million consumers. As set out in our business and microeconomic analysis paper in 2000, 2011, that was worth around £45.5 billion in trade for Scotland. That's double the amount Scottish businesses sell to the rest of the world. And the demand for Scottish goods and services from England, Wales and Northern Ireland contributes almost 30% of Scottish GDP. In turn, the rest of the UK exports almost £50 billion worth of goods and services to Scotland. Now, I'm not saying, of course, that all of this trade will be lost if Scotland votes yes in 2014. I'm not here to create an artificial argument. But our latest research does show that the long-term effect 
of a new border between our countries with all the new rules, regulations and systems it will require will reduce Scotland's GDP by 4%, equivalent to £5 billion in 2012 over the next 30 years. The UK's strong monetary and fiscal framework also provides investors and businesses in Scotland with the confidence, the certainty and the support that they need to grow. This includes strong national institutions like the Bank of England. And as a strong part of the UK, Scotland, of course, also makes its global voice heard with a seat at the table at the G8, the G20, NATO and the UN Security Council. And also, of course, it means that Scotland, through the UK's membership, can play a powerful part within the wider union of the European Union, shaping legislation, negotiating budgets and driving the future of the European Union single market. This time next year, the people of Scotland will be gearing up for one of the most important collective decisions that will ever be taken. Those who say Scotland could not be an independent state, of course they're wrong. Scotland could be an independent state, but my view is that Scotland's future is best served in the UK as part of our family of nations. Just because you can do something does not mean you should do something. In the 21st century, when countries around the world, within the European Union, in Latin America, Southeast Asia and beyond, are reaching out to cooperate with each other, I believe that it would serve no one if the nations of the United Kingdom family were to loosen the ties that bind us together. <clears throat> As the debate moves forward, it's becoming increasingly clear that the SNP will say anything to get the people in Scotland to vote for independence. They're trying to, to de-risk independence and make it seem less of a jump than it really is. But separating our family of nations through the creation of a new international border would inevitab inevitably mean a drifting apart. So that the strength that we draw from 300 years of economic integration, the solidarity of our common values that built the welfare state and the NHS and the security we share from standing together past and present, all of that will be lost. I will campaign proudly for Scotland to remain in the United Kingdom, not out of some nostalgia-driven attachment to the past, but out of a clear-sighted look to our own future. Just two, two days ago, the Chancellor was in Aberdeen to publish the latest in our series of Scotland analysis papers, which set out objective expert analysis on the realities of Scotland becoming an independent state. Everything points the same way. Our nations are better together than we are apart. We have a great deal of confidence in our argument and the facts speak for themselves. Already the answers put forward so far by the nationalists about what an independent future for Scotland might look like, they keep changing. In particular, what the economic realities of separation will mean for your business. You drive the Scottish economy. You create the jobs and the wealth that makes Scotland a great place to live and work. And I urge businesses across Scotland to remain a voice of reason, as Mike said earlier in this debate, relentless in securing honest answers about the choice Scotland has to face. But if Scotland votes no next year, this won't be the end of the story. A vote against leaving the UK family is a positive vote to remain within it and to be part of Scotland's evolving position within it. We can't let this debate to be set up as a, as a false choice between separation on the one hand and a status quo set in tablets of stone on the other. Because the more pragmatic reality is, which business accepts, is that nations adapt and evolve. Our manifesto has not been written yet, but I know that in 2015, the party that I lead, the Liberal Democrats, will be standing on a platform, platform of further powers for the Scottish Parliament. And as Liberal Democrats will be working to build a consensus with other political parties as well as businesses and people across Scotland to deliver this. Grimman, Steele, Kennedy, Campbell,
These are just some of the leaders of my party who down the years have set the Scottish debate alight and made a genuine, lasting difference. And within this coalition government, we have a strong record on this. Through last year's Scotland Act, 2012, we took substantial steps to improve Scotland's devolution settlement. And I want to thank uh, Mike Moore and his team for their work with you to ensure this new settlement will be one that serves the interests of Scottish business and Scotland's communities. The Act amounts to the biggest transfer of financial powers, including major tax and borrowing powers, from London to Edinburgh in 300 years. That work has been a priority for me in government because as a Liberal, I will always argue that our country is at its strongest and has, a, it, has its best shot at success when we share the power within it more fairly between our government and our people. And Ming Campbell's Home Rule Commission defined a truly modern settlement for a modern Scotland to be achieved through a major further transfer of financial and constitutional power from Westminster to Holyrood, with Holyrood raising the majority of the money it spends so Scotland can determine its own destiny on the domestic agenda. Fiscal responsibility is critical to a modern, mature parliament. One that has to balance the budget, not just spend the money. More devolution should also, of course, mean much more autonomy and power for local councils and, and communities across Scotland and across the United Kingdom, a proposition that the Scottish Government seems reluctant to accept. The Liberal Democrat proposition protects the UK single market, one of the most important things for business, a single currency, a single regulatory system, a single open free market. With home rule, we truly get the best of both worlds. Local power and authority right alongside global clout, social equity and economic strength. I'm pleased that the other parties are embracing this agenda too. Both Labour and the Conservatives have also set up their own commissions on more powers. Many others are joining the debate. I welcome this. It is in the best Scottish political tradition to have a broad, inclusive conversation about the best form of government in Scotland for the future. It worked to deliver devolution in the first place, and it can work to improve devolution. And I urge you to join it too. A thriving business sector provides the revenue on which our public services depend. So the future of devolution in Scotland must evolve in a way that enables your success too. This train is leaving the station. Debate is underway. So now is the time for you to express your views, to shape that debate, to influence and shape a modern and successful Scotland within a strong United Kingdom. And as if to illustrate the point, the day, um, the day after uh, Andy Murray won the men's single at, uh, at Wimbledon, uh, number 10 arranged a small uh, celebration in the Downing Street Garden. And there in the glorious July sunshine, the Prime Minister... Myself, Ed Miliband, Angus Robertson was there as well. We're listening to Andy explain how he'd beaten uh, Novak Djokovic. And then he suddenly said, um, he said, uh, oh, it's nice to see you all getting along so well. He said to us very seriously, it's a shame you can't be like this all the time, he said. But on this issue, of course, for all the things that the Liberal Democrats, the Conservatives and Labour argue tooth and nail about, the future of Scotland is something that we can and do agree on. It is, one of, it is one of the few issues where we will stand together. So in conclusion, the responsibility that rests on the shoulders of the people of Scotland today is considerable. One year from now, you will decide whether Scotland remains part of the United Kingdom or not. You won't just be making that decision for now, for yourselves, but forever. That's because there's no turning back. The future of the 300-year union is your call on the 18th of September next year. What I believe, what the evidence shows, is that the best future for Scotland is to be part of a strong United Kingdom. That is how we build a stronger economy. That's how we build and secure a fairer society. In a UK where every corner of our country prospers, and where every individual, English, Scottish, Welsh, and Northern Irish, can succeed.
Thank you very much for listening to me.